Greetings, friends of liberty. Twas more than once, when sailing my schooner daydream during these last decades, the time my crew, usually late at night, encountered the rough vessels of likely smugglers. Now, not only did I not object to their activity, but I must confess my share of decided sympathy with them. But why, you might ask? Why commiserate with those who violate the law? Specifically in this case, the Customs Act of 1745, which specifies the punishment of persons going armed or disguised in defiance of the law of customs or excise. Well, because those very excise or customs duties were often either punitive, being very high, or an exercise in monopoly, completely preventing the very selling or buying of goods by those on both sides of the channel. So, for example, the exportation of wool from England was sometimes prohibited. But why in God's name if an English farmer might sell his wool deer to the French, enriching both himself and England, should it be forbidden? Or why, in other cases, should customs have charged such piratical rates, Monty or Brandy, entirely out of proportion to their value? The problem, however, with the smugglers that lay not in the smuggling itself, but that the law being set against them, these gangs became violent. This certainly is to be lamented, but... Who should shoulder the blame? If customs duties or revenue laws, in their exorbitancy, fleece citizen and merchant alike? Thank God it must be said that our present Prime Minister, Pitt the Younger, has reduced customs rates charged significantly, while happily vastly increasing customs revenue. Well done! Prime Minister. Now, if we turn to the issue of the smuggling of contraband goods and the violence attendant in your own 21st century in both North and South America, we find that the degree of smuggling and the strength of drug gangs and cartels two centuries later has reached such epic proportions that they threaten the very stability and integrity of nation-states themselves. In today's book, Narcoland, the Mexican drug lords and their godfathers, journalist Annabel Hernandez details how the black market trade in numerous illegal drugs has sustained the existence of the richest smugglers and criminals of the underworld unrivaled in their violence and brutality. Given that our author both describes the ensuing chaos, corruption, and death, but also attempts to explain its causes, let's examine her book in both regards. Ms. Hernandez begins, number one, noting how often Mexican youngsters in poor agricultural regions, given the lucrativeness of the illegal drug trade, tend or harvest the poppy or marijuana fields when young and graduate from growing to guarding to transporting, to selling. Given their initial poverty, it's not surprising that accomplished drug lords are often admired or at least respected in playing the role of public benefactors, sponsoring weddings, festivals, football teams, and other activities and institutions. She describes the circumstances surrounding the kidnapping, number two, and especially brutal torture, even by cartel standards, of DEA agent Kiki Camarena in 1985 by members of the Guadalajara cartel Kiki snatched near the U.S. consulate. She points out that A. The kidnapping occurred because of the effectiveness of Camarena in getting information about the cartel, but how his death and extensive mistreatment was by all accounts inadvertent B. The case revealed the extent to which the CIA had various Mexican politicians on their payroll. C. The murder rewrote 
the implicit code of conduct between traffickers and government agents, since previously no one had tortured government agents, especially if they were gringos. Number three. Moving to general police and political corruption, she claims that by talking to a high-level official she called the informer, he revealed A. How back in the 1990s, colored flags were used on different pot fields to indicate which ones should be spared from helicopter fumigation. B. How again with the pot plantations, the Mexican army kept watch over the plantations. The drug traffickers paid a kind of tax to the federal government, $60 per kilo. How, at times, Mexican police would kidnap other traffickers or their relatives at the request, at the request of one group. D. How it commonly occurs that during election time, the traffickers pay for the campaigns and then get protection when their guys are elected. Number four. She knows the enormous degree of drug violence during the Mexican presidency of Felipe Calderón from 2006 to 2012, blaming it on him and saying he bears the burden of more than 80,000 people killed in the war on drugs, over 20,000 disappeared, around 200,000 driven from their homes, and hundreds of thousands victims of kidnappings, extortion, and general violence. She adds, accusingly, that during Calderon's six-year term, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, El Chapo meaning shorty, became the most powerful drug trafficker in history while his enemies were decipated. El Chapo's empire is Calderon's chief legacy. Number five, El Chapo apparently framed for the 1993 killing of Cardinal Juan Posadas, the Archbishop of Guadalajara, who was accidentally gunned down by a rival gang when the Cardinal's car was mistaken for that of Guzman himself, was captured in 1993 and promptly delivered as a scapegoat to Mexican authorities by being driven, hooded, and hogtied in the back of a pickup across the Chiapas by Guatemalan police, and then flown via 727 to Mexico City. He allegedly sang like a canary during the flight about his activities in working with a Colombian Cali in Medellin cartels and in paying a member of the federal police $500,000 to let me grow a marijuana crop. Although innocent of the Cardinal's murder, life, nonetheless, was good for Guzman in the Puente Grande prison, he being allowed cell phones, prostitutes, liquor, cocaine, and restaurant food with his secretary and accountant being only a few cells away. However, by 2001, hoping to avoid possible extradition to the U.S., he arranged his escape in a laundry cart, bribing over 50 officials in the process, his accounting charging that to operating expenses. Number six. In October 2001, a historic gathering was held in the city of Cuernavaca, and in the capital, which changed forever the rules governing the drug business, both inside and outside the cartels. What happened was that a number of cartels, the largest, the Sinaloa, joined forces together, creating an alliance called the Federation. El Chapo's unique contribution, she claims, was in bringing government contracts and bribed officials to help avoid governmental attention. Subsequently, the Federation began eliminating its enemies with, according to her, the help of the government during the administration of Vincente Fox from 2000 to 2006. Number seven, she also dwells at length, apart from the corruption, on the ever-increasing degree of violence displayed by the traffickers, each generation becoming more vicious. Some of the notable landmarks in this progression after the murder and torture of Camarena were a. The emergence of the newly formed cartel Los Zetas, the Zs, and their leader, Heriberto Lascano, the executioner. Why did Lascano name his group the Zs? Because, as he said, nothing comes after Z. The lyrics of a popular 2008 narco song went, We are 20 Zetas, united like a family. We 20 are the mighty with suicide diplomas, 
We know that in every mission, we could die. To these individuals, numbering at one point perhaps in the thousands, and many having undergone army or special forces training, strike you as peaceful souls? Lescano himself engaged in the most gruesome methods of torture and murder imaginable, letting captured persons be torn up by wild animals, slowly sinking them in baths of acid or boiling oil, or beating them to death slowly with a board over a period of days. What was left of the persons would be left on the side of the road, often with Z's carved into their decomposing corpses. B. The factional fighting and campaigns of destruction between different cartels increased. The Zetas, who were part of the Gulf Cartel, fought a deadly war of attrition against the aforementioned Federation, headed by El Chapo again, Guzman. An alleged instance of police cooperation was that when the police captured members of the Zetas, instead of imprisoning them, they just gave them over to the rough justice of the Federation, with one video in 2005 surfacing where a headshot was delivered to a captured Zeta, El Pizcacha. Number seven. Finally, there are the increasing spillover effects for all of Mexican society of the drug war. Let's list a few of these. A, the Zetas, for example, killed migrants passing through their territories with more than five mass graves found full of brutalized bodies, many of them beaten to death. B, the drug gangs now engage in kidnapping on a commercial scale, capturing thousands of entirely innocent human beings, demanding ransoms, sometimes torturing them, and slowly dismembering them, shipping ears or fingers, or videos of their sexual molestation, back to their families, and sometimes nonetheless, killing them despite the ransom being paid. One gang leader was reputed to have made more than $35 million from ransoms collected. C. Other types of crimes, like prostitution and human trafficking, were also increasingly sponsored and engaged in by the cartels. D. Given the huge sums of money made, the cartels launder it by investing in many other businesses. E, again, giving their mountains of cash, they corrupt officials in all kinds of institutions, such as in airports, so they and their produce can fly directly in and out, and they corrupt the leaders of other countries like Guatemala and Paraguay, who don't have the resources to withstand their violence. Finally, F, vigilante groups often arise in response to protect their own communities since the police often can't or won't. Let's turn now to evaluating the book. Of her journalism, which describes the violence and mayhem spread throughout Mexican society since the 1980s on, she merits a B+, giving us plentiful historical detail, gossip, and speculation about the relationships between the government, its drug war agencies, and relations with gringo agencies, the traffickers, and the civilians caught in the murderous crossfire. But turning to her causal understanding of what drives the violence and her suggestions of how to mitigate it, she falls miserably, fails miserably, getting an F. Number one, some of the greatest criminal organizations here astonishingly remain unidentified by her, the drug enforcement agencies of the United States government, namely the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, the Coast Guard, and others. But is this not hyperbole on my part to call a legal governmental body, the DEA, for example, a criminal organization? A criminal organization is any institution whose purpose is to violate property rights. So a gang of burglars or pickpockets a group of Nigerian online scammers, or a gang of sexual traffickers. Similarly, since the whole purpose of the DEA is to violate the rights of users and sellers of drugs, they too, along with their Mexican counterparts, are literally criminal organizations whose crimes are actually promoted and funded by American and Mexican taxpayers, respectively. Anyone, like our author, who supports the criminal activities of the American and Mexican drug enforcement agencies are supporting violent 
albeit legal, criminal organizations. Number two, what are the consequences of the creation and maintenance by governments of these criminal drug war organizations whose whole raison d'etre is to, contrary to the American Constitution and its mandate to protect property rights? A. Violence. Kidnapping and imprisonment visited upon anyone trying to sell drugs. You're grabbed and thrown in jail. That, then, results in B. An enormous increase in the price of illegal drugs. As Ms. Hernandez herself states, the profit margins are astonishing. Today, in 2010, you can buy a kilo of, kilo of quality cocaine in Colombia for $2,500. It sells in New York for $28,000 and in Spain for $33,000. So this is an 11 to 13 times markup. And other markups can approach 20 times and more. C. What are the effects of that enormous markup? First, many drug users or addicts can become impoverished. Or two, they engage in crime themselves with some heroin addicts committing hundreds of burglaries to feed their habit. Secondly, if you were to ask the devil himself how to devise the most perfect way to damage society, it would be by giving the most violent, vicious thugs you can find, drug traffickers and their hitmen, with zero compassion or empathy for others, tens of billions of dollars annually. And what does Ms. Hernandez think they're going to do with that money? They're going to buy the latest high-tech equipment to facilitate smuggling, building hundreds of tunnels connecting Arizona with Mexico, designing and producing virtually undetectable miniature narco submarines, funding the latest in drone delivery systems across the border using ultralight aircraft catapulting over the wall and hundreds of other methods virtually unimpeded in their trafficking. And they're going to spread their billions of wealth around by bribing as many policemen and politicians as need be. Does she imagine anything else could ever occur? And are they not going to pay thousands of hitmen annually to kill anyone who might betray them or stand in their way? A 2015 Cato report found that capturing a leading drug trafficker in a municipality increases its homicide rate by 80% over a 12-month period, which is exactly what happened when President Calderon from 2007 to 2012 intensified the drug war, causing drug war-related murders to increase six times from about 2,000 to 12,000 per year. Likewise, general homicide rates in Mexico went from 8,000 in 2007 to 33,000 in 2022. Thirdly, tens of thousands of users or addicts in the U.S. die unnecessarily every year because there is no way to complain to the retail seller if his product is adulterated or of unexpected strength. So, for example, as Reason reports, the annual rate of overdose deaths in Portugal, where drug use is decriminalized, is now 1 per 170,000 citizens. The figure is 33 times higher in the U.S. at 1 per 5,100. So, the more you prosecute the drug war, the more deaths you get, and the more profit cartels get. And that's exactly what Mexican history shows. A, as Reason Magazine summarizes, Mexico has suffered 250,000 homicides because of the drug war. Whole swaths of the country are now controlled by organized crime, including the states of Guerrero, Michoacan, Morelos, and Tamaulipas. The Jalisco New Generation Cartel has killed more than 100 officials in the state of Jalisco alone. Over a six-year period, 150,000 of the Mexican army's 250,000 soldiers deserted, finding higher wages in the drug industry. B, on the other hand, legalizing marijuana in the U.S. over the last 15 years has resulted in a significant decrease in the revenue going to the Mexican cartels, with mar marijuana seizures at the border down from 4 to 1.5 million pounds, and the cost of a kilogram of pot dropping from $75 to $35 on average. 
So in summary, the drug war in every country that is prosecuted is an enormous moral obscenity, a waste of human life and treasure on an epic scale. Happy for my part that here in 18th century England, the wisdom of our Prime Minister has led him to reduce the level of customs duties so that hardly any smugglers find it worthwhile anymore. I bid you well and remain the Scarlet Pimpernel.